Welcome to Stony Brook Church. We are so glad that you have found us and that you have chosen to worship with us here today. I am Reverend Jennifer Casey, and I bring you greetings on behalf of today's preaching pastor, the Reverend Lou Seipel, along with our pastor emeritus, the Reverend Bob Thomas. We'd love to know who is here worshiping with us today. If you could take just a moment and fill out our online connection card, we would ever so much appreciate that. If you uh, have found us on Facebook, you will see a link above the video. Simply click that link that says connect card and it will take you to our website and you can fill out the appropriate information. If you are on YouTube, you can simply go to stonybrook.church, click on the gray box that says connect card on our webpage, and it will take you to uh, the link to fill out your connection card. Our uh, website, stonybrook.church, is also the place where you can go to give to continue to support uh, the mission and ministries of Stony Brook Church. When you go to the home page up at the top right hand corner, you will find a red give button. Simply click on that and it will take you to a secure page where you can um, fill out your online donation. And as always, we continue to welcome um, checks in the mail, either from your bank's online bill pay or through your own personal check that you may be writing. Stony Brook continues to be a generous congregation. Uh, in early May, Ben Lilly, our Director of Youth Ministries, invited Stony Brook to give to a special Appalachian Service Project Fund to honor our 2020 graduates. He set a goal for you of $2,020, and I am happy to report that as of the recording of this worship service, you have given $2,972.40. This money is gonna be sent directly to ASP to support, they, to support the work that they do there with our Appalachian brothers and sisters. Thank you, Stony Brook, so much for your continued generosity. In the service today, you're going to be treated to some pictures of some of the service projects that are keeping our church community busy. On behalf of Emily Keener, our Director of Outreach and Missions, we are so grateful for the ways that you continue to be the hands and feet of Christ in the world. If you would like to get involved, you can go to um, find the list of opportunities that are on our website. Simply go to stonybrook.church slash volunteer. Your leadership board, your virus task force, and your staff have been working diligently and very hard to develop a draft plan on reopening the church building. Each person that serves on one of these teams has your safety at the forefront of their minds. In a church as complex and as sophisticated as Stony Brook, there are many variables that we need to consider. So as concrete plans are developed, we will be sharing those with you in a variety of ways. Please know that we hear you, and when we do start to resume our in-person worship services, we will also still continue online worship services for those who continue to want to worship from home. We will be celebrating communion today. Uh, after the sermon, if you don't already have your communion elements uh, with you, you are invited to uh, run to your kitchen and uh, grab a piece of bread or a cracker and some juice and water so that you can participate in communion later in worship. Friends, I now invite you to join me in the call to worship. You will see your responses in bold on the screen. 
Hear, O friends, our God is one God, and we are one people. We are called from all times and places, from all circumstances and positions, to be disciples of the Christ, our Lord. Our witness to, power, to the power of God's presence among us is needed. We will serve the Lord with heart, mind, soul, and voice. Amen. disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some, some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded, to, commanded you. And remember, I am with you all with you always to the end of age, of the age. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Will you join me in a spirit of prayer? Oh God, you have sent each of us into the world to be your hands and feet, your representatives. This is never an easy task, but these days it seems even harder. We are limited in the ways we can interact with one another. Our communities are hurting. We are hurting. Help us, O oh God, pour out your spirit on us over and over again. Open us up to you and to your presence in this world. And as we are opened up, let us feel, no matter how hard it may be, the pain of our nation the pain of our African-American brothers and sisters. Move us to action, O oh God. Show us how to engage with others in humility and a spirit of openness. May we listen with ears to learn, not ears to judge. May we love with hearts of softness, not hearts of stone. May we pray with earnest, really hearing and feeling your breath moving through us, calling us to do our part. And in the midst of the pain in our community, we still have our own hurts and our own worries. We are fearful. We are fearful and we are worried about our loved ones, O oh God. We mourn those who we've lost and we yearn for connection. Plant yourself deep in our heart, O oh God, and remind us to center ourselves on you no matter what. We pray all of this in the name of Christ Jesus as we now join our voices together, praying the prayer that he taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me as we begin? Bless, O Lord, the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts. O Lord, our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. Amen. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. 
Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I've always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day since we're together. We might as well say, would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please, won't you be my neighbor? On Tuesday evening, Craig and I watched the movie, It's a Beautiful Nay in the Neighborhood, released just a few months ago. It's a fabulous story of a reporter's assignment to write an article about Fred Rogers. But the plot is about how Fred Rogers changed his life. One of the clear and consistent messages of this dear film is that there are ways when handling difficult and painful feelings that we can do so without hurting ourselves or others. Given the events of our days, the brokenness of our nation, so divided and broken by racism, the struggle to find our feet with this COVID-19. Wouldn't you just love to have a neighbor like Fred Rogers? How are we going to make it through these difficult days without hurting ourselves or hurting others? I can't help wondering if we're going to find the kind of mutual respect, caring and compassion, even the patience and the will to do whatever it takes to be real neighbors. Frankly, there are days when I have my doubts. And that's exactly why I love this scripture. Matthew says, when they saw him, they worshipped him. And without flinching, he adds, but some doubted. From the very beginning, among those closest to Jesus, there was doubt. In this otherwise transcendent, triumphant moment, when Jesus is giving his last instruction to the disciples, the scripture we call the Great Commission, there are some who do not really grasp or trust what has gone on in front of them. But some doubt it. We might be tempted to think that the disciples doubted Jesus himself, but may I remind you, the scripture doesn't say that. Could they have doubted their place among the other disciples? Could they have doubted their worthiness to carry such a profound message of love and compassion when they struggled to get there even with each other? Maybe some doubted their ability to live the same kind of sacrificial life Jesus had lived in front of them. Perhaps, perhaps rather, they doubted their own stamina in light of such an open question, such an enormous one. To make disciples, could they do that? This message had cost Jesus his life. I wonder if the nature of doubt is left open for us in this scripture as a question. 
so that doubt of Jesus, doubt of selves, doubt of our righteousness, doubt of any ability means that doubt of any kind is okay. Is doubt, after all, anything more than the examination of all things important, keeping us humble instead of arrogant, keeping us searching for understanding as our actions and opinions are shaped and planned? Doubt is not presented here as an obstacle to discipleship, but as a real part of discipleship from the very beginning. For if some who were there and actually witnessed the experience of the risen Christ and who gathered on that mountain to worship and to hear him speak, and they still doubted. Well, doesn't that leave room for the rest of us? Doubt, my friends, is not a dirty word. Matthew uses it only twice in his gospel here and in chapter 14, where Jesus walks on water to join the disciples in their boat. The disciples are terrified in the storm as he approaches, and Peter pops up on seeing Jesus and asks that Jesus command him to come to him. You know the rest of the story. Peter sinks. Jesus immediately reaches his hand out to save him, saying, You of little faith, why do you doubt? Doubt here is used as a verb, meaning to hesitate or to sit on a fence, literally to stand in two places. In this context, doubt isn't such a, as much a character flaw as it is a recognition that it leaves one straddling the fence. It's human, but it's not a place to live. Barbara Brown Taylor, in her reflection on this scripture, says, And why shouldn't the disciples at this point in their lives struggle with doubt? Why shouldn't they have a foot in one camp of belief and one camp of doubt? Not one of them had witnessed the resurrection, not even the women who reported on it. Like Peter, the identified doubter in Matthew, some are hesitant to step out onto the water with no proof that the surface is going to hold. Yet there they are, all of them, Worshipping anyway, accepting the risk of devoting themselves to something that makes their knees wobble. Now, is that hypocrisy or faith? Does the existence of doubt in the worship of Jesus mean that something's wrong? Or does it mean that something is right? That when people with no idea how deep the water really is are willing to step out into it anyway, trusting that even in their doubt they cannot be separated from the one who loves them, the one true God. Faith isn't as much a lack of doubt as it is a willingness to step into the deep when you can't see the bottom. My friends, because even when they wrestled their faith, the most amazing thing happens. Jesus decides to give them a job. In the full awareness that these disciples are still learning, they're still growing, they are flawed and often bumbling. 
he's going to give them a massive job. And what is it? To go and make disciples of nations, baptizing them into the company of motley numbskulls and cowards and squabblers, teaching them about Jesus so that together when they worship, they become a family that is blessed to wrestle their faith together. Disciples are called to create a complex family, learning from grace how to serve and to love one another to change the world. Don't forget that this difficult job description has Jesus asking them to teach others to obey everything that he has commanded. Which, by the way, is extremely hard. And it gives us every reason to doubt our ability to do it. When was the last time you enjoyed turning the other cheek when attacked? How about going the second mile when the first one was neither recognized nor appreciated? How about being asked to hand over your shirt and, oh, by the way, your coat too, if it's demanded and needed of you? Don't forget that we're asked to give to all who ask whether or not they deserve it, need it, or will use it appropriately. After all that, we are to love all God's people, which has nothing to do with liking them. This love is very expensive. And while we're at it, don't forget we're asked to love our enemies as well. Last but not least, neighbors and strangers alike are to be welcomed into our community of mutual love. My guess is that there are some days when we're up to it and some days when we're not. I was able to watch a documentary this week about the imam and the pastor. Imam Ashafi, oh, excuse me, Asifa, excuse me, and Pastor Wu Ye are religious leaders in Kanduna, a city in northern Nigeria. Today they are working with warring religious militias to resolve their conflicts peacefully but they didn't start out as peacemakers. 10 years ago, the imam and the pastor were mortal enemies, absolutely intent on killing one another in the name of religion. In 1992, their violent interreligious conflict broke out in Kanduna State where Christians and Muslims fought each other in the marketplace, destroyed each other's crops and stores, attacking each other's families. Both the imam and the pastor paid an enormous price. The imam lost two brothers and his teacher. The pastor lost his right hand. After this event, both of them dreamed of revenge. And it was then that a mutual friend came to them and took both of them by the hand, brought them together and said, the two of you can pull this nation together or you can destroy it. Do something. It was over the next few years that they came to have a mutual respect for each other. And the two men created the Interfaith Mediation Center in which it's a grassroots religious organization to bring Christian and Muslims together. They now have 10,000 members 
reaching into the militia and training the country's youth, as well as the women, religious figures, and tribal leaders to be peace advocates. Under their leadership, these warring Muslim and Christian youth are now rebuilding the churches they destroyed during the war and the violence. They had plenty of hatred to fight. And so do we. Hatred and racism are tearing us apart. We've broken, faithful, flawed, and doubting people that today are called to a choice. We can pull our community together, or we can be a part of its destruction. It's no wonder that some doubt, no wonder that some of us do. This big, hairy, audacious job description to go into all the world with the purpose of bringing about the kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven is nothing less than stepping off into deep water, trusting that God will save us. Thanks be to God, there is great good news to be found within this text for the weary, the broken, or the doubtful. The most important part of the Great Commission is this. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. With the Spirit's outpouring of love upon us at Pentecost, God is offering an unconditional promise to walk into this unpredictable and beautiful world, broken and healing with us. I'm not always sure that we recognize the enormity of this promise. The exalted Christ does not say, I'm going to come later at the end of history after an immense period of time, an absence. Jesus promises to be a powerful presence in the midst of ongoing history. Yoked to the disciples of every age, dwelling in their midst through times of grace and times of crisis, feeding them with the richest promise, I am with you always. I am with you always. I am with you always. Christy DeVries met with our church staff this past Tuesday morning and shared a very delightful, helpful image to help us keep ourselves grounded in these difficult and uncertain days. The image was of a hot air balloon. To keep the balloon from floating away, there are ropes tied to weights that keep the balloon grounded. She said, what we have to do is identify the things that keep us grounded. She asked us to identify those places of grounding, uh, family, colleagues at work, friendships, and for both Christy and me, it's our gardens. But the surest anchor of all is this forever promise of God's presence with us. For every person, Believing or doubting, standing strong or crumbling, Jesus' promise to be with us is sure. So in this unprecedented, tumultuous time, let's take a deep breath. Let's breathe and remember our grounding. I'm so grateful to stand still 
for a moment in the words and promises of Christ. I'm so grateful for the powerful urging of Jesus to be about what matters most. But even more than that, I'm grateful that Matthew names the truth, that everyone was there together to worship there on that mountain. Both those who were of faith and whose faith was firm and those who struggled with doubt, all of them were there to worship. And whether we believe with certainty or not in any given time, it should not matter. It must not matter for we belong to this gathering of God's people. We've been called to go. Make disciples that look like Jesus, that act like Jesus, knowing that the promises of God's presence is always with us. And if we can't breathe and simply remember that, then we can name our doubt and slosh our way into the deep murky waters of the day with the sure and certain promise that we are not alone. We will get through this time and by God's grace, bringing with us a blessing. God is with us. And that's no small promise in the job description we've been given. It is therefore no surprise, my friends, that on the very night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took this bread to seal the promise. And he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat it in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup and having blessed it, he gave it to them saying, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink it when you're together in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ present with us, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast together at his heavenly banquet. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat it in remembrance of him. The cup of salvation poured out for you. Drink it in remembrance of him. Let's pray. It's so easy, Lord, to forget how close you are, to forget how not to hurt ourselves and to hurt others. Be so close to us, we pray that our awareness is of your presence with us, whether or not 
we can feel it in the moment, whether we doubt our ability or our strength. For the gift of this blessing of your presence, your life among us, we give you thanks today and always. Amen. May the peace of Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen. <laughs>